We're so excited to be here tonight with Liza Liu <laughs> and had to have all of you here tonight with us. We are kind of inextricably linked, uh, Liza and the New Museum, uh, because she had her first very important show or exhibited kitchen at the New Museum in 1996 in A Labor of Love that was organized by Marsha Tucker, which I know some of you attended, many of you saw. And here is the work that kind of um, brought you to world attention when you were still in your 20s. Yeah. Quite a young artist. So um, was it your first exhibition? And how did it come about? No, it wasn't exactly my first, ooh, now sing for you. Um, it wasn't my first exhibition, but it was the first ex exhibition of the kitchen completed. So, oops. <laughs> yeah. And it was, a, it was a moment for sure. I mean, just to go from working alone for five years to suddenly, you know, and also the, the show being a group show with 50 other artists and um, the way that the kitchen was received was, was pretty life-changing. Yeah. It's all your fault. <laughs> It was definitely noticed and um, by many, and you said it took five years to make, and I did read that you were at the San Francisco Art Institute and decided to leave because the way that you were working wasn't quite respected. Is that true? I mean, was this, was this the outcome of that? I mean, it kind of was. I was at art school, and um, I was really disappointed that the graffiti was really bad. And I felt like, you know, when you're in art school, it should be good. I mean, the graffiti should be kind of amazing in the bathrooms, right? But it wasn't. And, I, and that, was one, that was one nail in the coffin. But I was there for two months. And um, the reason that people know, I mean, you think two months, they probably, if they really looked at it, they would go, well, we don't even know you were there. But because I um, didn't graduate um, and I made this work that was potentially going to be so misunderstood, it was really important to me that I say I went to art school, because, even if I dropped out, because otherwise you would be a, a, an outsider artist. And I very, very much am an artist. And so in order not to be understood, I gave the San Francisco Art Institute a lot of credit. But I was only there two months. I absolutely hated it. <laughs> and um, um, yeah, and actually, um, they've been nice to me, though. They call me alumni anyway. <laughs> As well they should. Yeah, yes. well, I don't know. So maybe you could just talk a little bit about this piece um, so that we can uh, put it in the proper proper perspective with what came afterwards. I mean, we're going to look at a whole range of things, but I mean, this is really packed a punch. And I mean, you got so much attention for it. What's it like to have a hit when you're in your 20s? Hmm. I thought I was really old by the time it came out and was completed. You know, when I began the piece, I, I guess I was 19, and I thought it would take three months. And um, I was really cried bitter tears when I was turned 25, and it was, you know, that was when I actually finished. It sounded very old to be 25 to me because I had worked on this so long. And it did kind of, in a way, the germ of the idea maybe was partially um, as a painter walking into a bead store and seeing that it was paint. So that was the initial thing. And then once I started to put beads in my paintings, I was kind of derided as sort of like, this was decorative, this was not serious. And it seems almost impossible, I think, for today's audience to imagine that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Because it's so, it's so obvious that you use anything. And But then it wasn't like that at all. You know, especially as a feminist, you know, you were going to make work that was quite, um, a, it was like the time of bloody tampons, I would say, sort of like late 80s kind of feminist art. And I really wanted to talk about feminism from a sexier point of view. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was not well received. And I thought, my God, that's great. I'm really upsetting people. And that just seemed like a good thing. And so it really inspired me, oddly enough. I mean, it sort of was like, it's hard to offend anyone with beauty, really. You know, I thought that was interesting. I thought it was subversive. And I loved being misunderstood. It was, I mean, it's a little weird to try to s describe that, but it felt kind of, it, it always seemed to tell me I was doing the right thing. 
And um, how did you come to meet Marsha Tucker? How did she come to know about you? Well, I had um, I was living in Southern California, and I'd been working on the kitchen for about three years. And um, I had a friend that was uh, in graduate school at Cal State Fullerton, mm. and she was studying curatorial. She was curatorial studies, and um, she'd seen what I was doing and wrangled it so that I could show part of the kitchen in progress at Cal State in the in the, the graduate school gallery. So I got this tiny little space as though I'd gone to grad school. And um, the kitchen went there, and it was called Kitchenette. And we made this really cheesy picture um, of me in a wedding gown, like holding a pie inside the kitchen, partially made. And I was like, you know, I sort of, it was a kind of performance art thing that I did, which I don't think we should talk about. But it was something I used to do. <laughs> it's a little embarrassing. But, uh, and I sent it to Marsha. Uh, I sent the, this postcard to Marsha. Um, and I sent it to a lot of people, to be honest. And uh, Marsha called me from home and basically said, you know how she does, you know, oh, my God, oh, my God. And she said, um, you know, I'm calling you from home. This is perfect. This is perfect. I'm doing a show. You know, you have to show it at my show. And, and, you know, I was totally enamored with her. I mean, she was like a god of, you know, this is, a, you know, the goddess of feminism and of everything. And so you just say yes. Like, and, um, and she was so kind. So it was a year before I'd actually technically finished the kitchen. And so it gave me this wonderful gift during the last year of knowing it was going somewhere. Because the whole time I was doing it for the prior four years, um, I had no assurance of anything. I didn't have teachers or friends or anyone in the art world. I was living in, um, by the end of the kitchen, I started it in LA and then um, there was an earthquake in 92. I lived in San Diego at the end. So I was very isolated. So to have the gift of Marsha and her friendship during that year leading up um, was astonishing. And the conversations we had were, were really important to me. So She must have felt like it was a miracle to discover you, too, and what you had done over those five years. I mean, the exhibition was about folk art and craft being devalued and lifting it up in a way that, um, you know, she deeply believed in, but she she must have just been so mesmerized to well, yeah, discover your like, work too. Yeah, she was kind of like, you know, this is what was fascinating about Marsha was that, you know, firstly, yeah, she was like, oh my God, this is everything my show was about. This is every single thing. It sums it up entirely, which really scared me because, you know what I mean? Because I didn't know where it fit yet. I just knew like all I was saying at the time was, this is art. This is art. And I was fighting for that, just simply that craft can be art, that that simply was my biggest struggle and fight. But also the fact that she loved Tuttle, that she, that, that she, when she first discovered Bruce Nauman hated the work, and her epiphany was when she kind of, you know, stepped into his head and understood it and saw the world differently. So she's someone that deeply understood another kind of work. And it always, like, kind of confused me that she could like mine. But that was Marcia. She was someone who was always interested in changing her own mind. And not very many people, not many curators want to do that. You know, most people, when we see art we don't like, that's it, done, don't like it. Marsha goes, oh, I don't like it, it's probably really good. That's right. The more it troubles you, the better it is, absolutely. And that's, yeah. that's the mission of the new museum. I mean, you're founded on that mission, so. It's a, a pretty exciting it. place to be because you have to be willing to be uncomfortable a lot. Um, but you get to great places that way. So, <laughs> yeah. So I, I just want to hear a little bit more about your relationship with Marsha because it started there, but it really evolved into something um, much deeper. And you had such a, an inv involved friendship and uh, were there right to the end, and you worked really closely with her. So I'd love to hear a little bit about that, just as a slight a digression, detour. because we're here. So. Yeah, I mean, Marcia was right from the start. I, I used to call her my art mother. Um, my own personal history um, with um, my own mom is that she gave up art mm. in order to join the church. And so... Um, she had a loft in New York um, that was Roy Lichtenstein was in the same loft building. Oh, my mother was an actress, and so she was um, 
had all, you know, but, but she really struggled. She came from nothing. You know, she was like, came from Fridley, Minnesota and made her own way. She literally put a hundred dollars pinned to her bra and took a train to New York city to become an actress. So she really, really struggled. And, um, um, I think the struggle became a lot and she joined the church and gave it all up. So, um, I grew up though, knowing about Roy and knowing that art was possible. And she never told me I should not be an artist. She encouraged me. So she was, you know, a really um, wonderful in that way. Um, but meeting Marsha, who was about the same age as my mom, and although Marsha would hate this, so sorry, Marsha. Um, <laughs> she, we were really friends. She didn't want to be my mom. But, you know, I was in my 20s, and I was pretty un, unparented in a certain part of myself. And, and she just was so, um, she always wanted to know, who's your boyfriend? Who you did, you know, like she was always like that. She was just not like she wasn't normal. She was just so <laughs> kind, you know. Like she was, come stay at my house. If you were in the city, you stayed with Marsha. That's how she was, and that just kind of evolved over the years and into deep friendship. And um, I, I have, I have one regret, and, and I hope for those listening, um, you know, like sometimes you are in awe of someone and you don't want to trouble them or call them too much. Um, call them. And I think if I have one regret, I would have called her more often and, and, and put myself upon, like trusted that we really were friends because I, I was always in awe of her. Um, she put so much trust in you and you worked with her on her autobiography and then on the collected essays yeah. later on. So. Yeah, I mean, when she, was, when she got sick, it was right before she left the new museum, right before she retired. And um, but she had just gotten this, you know, terminal kind of diagnosis. And she had been, her, her memoir, which she'd been working on for years, um, had been accepted by a publisher. But she didn't have the strength to finish it. The publisher said they would publish, but only with the proviso if she would revise. And she had written this thing kind of like Spalding Gray's, you know, autobiography. It was like literally like, like up to, oh, yeah. it, was, it was like a thousand pages. It was super long. And so they said, if you will revise and edit, we'll publish. But she was so, she was really beside herself because she couldn't do it. And she'd always, um, I don't know, it was a weird thing, but she kind of knew about my writing, and, um, and I told her I'd help her. And she was like, oh, great. So for, um, I don't know, I guess a few months, she and I were able to work together on the first 100 pages and really, really talk about what would happen. And then it was obvious she was she needed to take her pain meds, and it was time for her to go home to Jesus. And um, she would hate that expression, but I would say it. Um, but anyway, she um, and I just carried on and finished it for her. Yeah. And that was when I got to know Marsha Tucker, yeah. was reading all her papers and, um, and really, you know, things that she didn't talk about. She never talked. She never put herself on, her, on other people or talked about her own pain or struggles, really. She was always there for others. So, um, you know, I got to understand a lot more about her. Thank you. That's my story on Thank Marcia. you, thank you. <laughs> I wanted to, uh, I'm trying to decipher what that headline says up there. <laughs> oh, it says Housewife Beads the World. Ha Housewife Beads the World, right? Yeah. Yes. Beads the World. Program reveals the secrets of tough love. Plus, yeah, Frogman reveals the secrets of tough love. Frogman. Yes. Frogman. They say, well, we're going deep on this. Uh-oh. <laughs> All my little yeah, secrets. Well, you know, I was, I've been this for five years. So uh, my life was in this, right? Like I wasn't making other works of art. I waitressed and sold prom dresses during the day. And then at night I would work on the kitchen. So my life was in it. If I was in a relationship, all that stuff. And like I said, I used to do these performances, you know, where I would dress up in a wedding gown and uh, heal the community, you know, cause I was, you know, you're young, you do these crazy things. And, um, so Housewife Beats the World, it was the idea that you come down to breakfast and be like, honey, what did you do? You know, like the whole place would be covered in beads. And, um, and that was kind of my ethos that every square inch, though, when you turned over the newspaper, it also is covered in beads. When you, turn, when you go to the bottom of the bowl of cereal, it's beaded. Each and every flake of cereal really is beaded. It's the real thing. So undersides are completed on most objects. Yeah. There's so much simulation going on here, too, mm. <laughs> and a lot of abstraction, which uh, I know you develop later on tremendously, but it's just hard to believe that there was any resistance to the idea of using a particular material 
or working in a particular way at that time. It's just, it's hard to imagine now. Well, it's I even think, hard yeah. to imagine that that was the case then in 96. It's almost shocking. Well, in 96, it was always, you know, oh, my God, why beads? You know, now you just wouldn't have that. You know, when this went to the Whitney 20 some years later, yeah. the conversation was so much different. When this first was shown, um, Elizabeth Sherman, who wrote um, for the book, um, traces the history of the kitchen, how it was received. You know, it was in the Guinness Book of World Records. It was on Oprah. It was like really over the top type of, whoa. Oh my God. You know, I had the guy call me up and say, would you show the kitchen in the world's largest roller skate? You know, like I got like really far out kind of offers and you know, it's just, it was just, and now I think people, it was much more, um, it's really lovely now because people can see the work and see it for what it is without all the words like razzle dazzle. <laughs> you know, the adjectives got better. Mm. Okay, well, we go next. Maybe we can go to we'll go to the next. Well, we're kind of skipping right now to um, the trail. Several years later, really? Yes, this is an abbreviated little tour, but this is um, minimal. Yeah, this is a um, a forty foot long um, Spartan mobile home, which um, I bought in the Mojave Desert out in California, and then parked it in uh, Topanga where I lived for many years. And um, then I gutted the interior and made this, um, I wanted to make an environment that felt like walking into a black and white movie. And um, so the pixels, and I also wanted to describe a male environment after the kitchen and after all that color, I'd been, made several things after the kitchen which were incredibly kind of technicolor. And it was always this annoying conversation that never quite got down to I don't know, it was, the meaning of the work was hard, hard for people to wrap their minds around. It became so much about almost a circus kind of display. Mm -hmm. And so my work became more and more minimal, I think, to try and speak to something that was deeper. There's this great um, Don DeLillo quote, which is about, you know, why do possessions carry such sorrowful weight? And, and I, I think it's true. I tried to describe a murder through objects, a kind of like a film noir like something's gone wrong and you can trace each object and try and figure it out. So I was imagining, you know, a lone guy living in a, in a trailer in the middle of the woods. It was kind of the time of the, the yeah, it was the time of Kaczynski and kind of that. Um, but this has not been a work that's been seen. You know, it's really interesting um, working for many years. You make the work and then, this was originally shown at Deitch Projects in 2002, and it was a show that didn't get reviewed. It didn't get really seen very much. Um, it was kind of ignored, and um, um, and then a collector bought it, actually, put it on their land, where really, again, it was kind of, I used to joke, it's kind of in the crypt. But I'm happy to say they donated it to the Brooklyn Museum, and um, it's about to go in their lobby on permanent display. That's great. So, Congratulations. Yeah. Pretty excited. That's we just had the official news today. So yay. Yeah, that's yeah. great. So this is this kind of description of objects and also thinking about pattern. Um, you know, it's funny, the floors in the trailer are based on a an Egyptian pattern actually, but but it's sort of we think of it as a 1960s kind of pattern. Yeah, so pattern and decoration, obviously, have come, you know, 20 years prior. People like Kushner and McConnell and Tommy Schmidt, Lanigan Schmidt and others. So there was that discussion going on. One of the first artists I worked for was Scott Burton, worked with, worked with and for. Uh, and that was in the 70s. So, you know, thought a lot about those issues and continued to. So. Yeah, it is, it's surprising to me that it took so long for people to come around to uh, seeing beads as material for, you know, and I, and I think right now we still have some prejudice about media. I see it in, particularly in digital work, um, that there still is 
a sort of resistance and reluctance to, to value it as just a material. It's really what you do with it. Otherwise, yes, things have intrinsic properties, but it's what the artist does with it in the end. I think, yeah. I think there is a certain thing that happens. I, I've often thought about, um, uh, you know, if, if someone's looking for an excuse not to like something, right, then, then they can hook it on something like that. But it, it always has seemed ridiculous to me and, and silly. And, um, and, and it, at, at bottom, it's, it's, it's racist, actually. And at bottom, it's, it's sexist, right? Because mm. it's it's a political decision to choose a material that has its its um, its roots in um, in labor and in in making. It's it's at bottom to say that making has no value is 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 classist. So I mean, every single taboo in that you can think about in terms of like sort of in terms of hatred is there. And I think that what I saw in making the kitchen was that, oh, this is the experience of what it is to be a woman. This is the, I'm making work that's very specific to a woman's experience, and of course it's not going to be taken seriously mm. um, for a long time. You know, I did know it going in. I wasn't sort of naive about that. I, I, don't, think, I don't think you should be an artist if you hope to be loved. You, you want to be an artist because you want to make the thing you want to say, and it has to be so strong for you, right? It's not there. I mean, it's like, yeah, that, that thing about being approved of is just such a bugaboo. God. And it's, I feel really suspicious when things are celebrated that I do. So, you know, I think, oh, no, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> yeah, as Marcia said, fail early and fail often. That was her motto. So, yeah, she felt most comfortable doing that. Testing herself, testing her assumptions. Um, so, yeah, I see. And changing her own mind. I mean, that was such a central thing, I think, um, that mm -hmm. idea of, of posting her bad reviews on her website. I mean, that's yeah. such a cool thing. I just saw recently someone made a book of their bad reviews, but it's like, Marcia did that 20 years ago, 25 years ago. She did. She yeah. said her whole history was a history of bad reviews. And she was really proud of it. So yes, yeah, yes. And she said something really. And we great. often yes. ask ourselves, "What's you know, we're getting too many good reviews. There's something wrong with that." Uh huh. So, yeah, uh -huh. you know, yeah. We can hear her voice. It's time to disturb the <laughs> the status quo, right? Yeah. 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 I, she said she has a great story about that. When she was at the Whitney, she uh, was she curated the is it the new sculpture show? What is it? What was it called? It was the it was a really important show that she did with James Monty. Do I have the names right? Do you remember? Anti illusion. Yes, thank you. And she um, was had just put up the last painting, and they just installed the whole show. And a and a really important curator came in and just said to Jim, "Good job, Jim." And she literally was just standing there, like he didn't acknowledge her contribution at all. And she basically fled out of the museum in tears and mm -hmm. ran and met a friend in the park. And the friend said, "Look, it's not one show, it's not five shows, it's a lifetime of shows." And I think that's so true. Mm -hmm. I mean, because. 25 years later, a work can finally get see the light of day. Yeah. Well, we're really proud of our history here and of women's leadership and the kind of um, program that we've had since the inception because of Marsha and the founding principles of the museum. And um, 10 years ago, we founded a council for to support women artists called the Artemis Council. Um, and many of them are here tonight. Uh, and the, the proportion of women that we show now has increased from what it was over 50%, but now it's increased to 60 or 70% just through that intentional focus, um, further intentional focus. So I think, you know, the, this is, we're, we continue to make progress. I'm very happy about that. Um, you know, as as that discussion about feminism and women's work is continuing to be complicated too. It's it's continuing to evolve in. in um, and I know Marcia was was always thinking that through too. You know where this is where she started, which was. Uh, in very much of a 
a, a white middle class community and you know where where she ended up with, through constant questioning over those 25 years. Dissatisfaction, always this kind of dissatisfaction with how things were and wanting to change them. Yeah, yeah, it's quite quite powerful to build a museum based on those principles. It's quite powerful. Yes. So let's look at some more work. Next, here. skipping ahead by another decade, <laughs> basically. Um, I wanted to show a picture of a work that um, was made in, um, really in collaboration um, it kind of went from the kitchen, which was I see this piece security fence as the as the um, I would love someday to see these two work side by side, the kitchen and security fence, because the kitchen was made alone and the security fence is made um, with a collective. I um, got very disillusioned with um, I think after making the trailer and you know doing this work and maybe a little bit about sort of feeling like. I was a little bit hidden in plain sight, and I, I sort of just started to think about, I just started working with a gallery for the first time, and I got afraid of sort of becoming this luxury watchmaker, basically. I was just going to make work, and then, this just sounds so funny, but the make work was going to sell, oh, you know. But I, I had originally, you know, made the kitchen. It wasn't, it was about, um, it was never about making money. It was, you know, you, you don't make money on your art. You, you have a day job and then you make your art. That's how it was. You know, that's, that's what you do. And then you show in museums and the kitchen traveled for like eight, nine years. So I thought that that was just going to go on. You know, I'd make the trailer and then it would go to the next museum. I just thought that that was how it was. And, and I found out that isn't how it is, that, that you don't have control about where your work goes. And so I started to think about, well, if I don't have control about where it goes, but I do have control of what I make, also what about how I make it? Like, just what about if, like, like if the making of the work could make a difference so that no matter what happens in the world, I make this thing and, you know, some oligarch wants to buy it or whatever, you know, that's great, but I have the making is doing this thing. What about that? And it led me to... Um, a uh, writing letters to different nonprofits all over um, and saying, you know, I'm this artist, I work in a craft metier, um, I'm not looking for funding, I work with beads, who, who, where should I go, where, who could I work with, where, where in the world, and I thought I would go to India, and I, um, I it was told to go to South Africa. So um, I was introduced to someone who had a kind of a craft concern there who would help me find uh, women to work with. And I um, literally made this sculpture in Los Angeles, shipped it in crates, brought, packed all my beads, like, you know, 100 kg of, of these beads, rented a dance hall in Durban, South Africa, and started a collective. And um, my idea was, you know, make this one sculpture. And um, I ended up living there for 10 years and working there for 15. So it And it was this prison cage. Yes. Work that you made there. Yes. And you went to Durban because the, the craftswomen were, were located there? Yes, because, you know, I really wanted to, it wasn't sort of like this idea of like, I'm just going to do good. You know, it was sort of like, no, I want to, you know, clearly I want to make a difference, but also I want to work with people who are the best in the world at beads mm -hmm. so that I was no longer sort of trying to, you know, train people in something they didn't know about, actually work with people so that that craft would continue in their culture. So maybe like a cultural exchange was kind of my idea. Like, look at how I work with this material. I'm going to pay you really well. What about that? Like it was a kind of, kind of, um, you know, creative experiment. Like, what would happen if? What if I gave you guys all these bees? Look, learn, learn, I'm going to show you how I do it. You know, and it was, well, a lot happened. So now you're collaborating with with a group. Yeah, yeah, in a sense. I mean, I knew what I was making, but it was definitely this kind of collective experience of working in a room with people's energy and um, way of looking at the beads. An individual way of working with the beads, right? And their touch, their selection. Well, it so didn't, there must at first, have been some irregularities. And yeah, some I mean, at first, no. At first, I was very much training 
people to work in my particular way that I'd evolved over many years. So you can see these details and they're, you know, the way that I worked from the kitchen onward was gluing. So, which is not any kind of practice anywhere. It's something I kind of figured out. And it was kind of like you glue, you take these strings and you do this thing. So for them, they're weavers. Mm -hmm. So this was, and even this material being this um, monochrome would not be something that would be traditional to Zulu. But, you know, I have to say that part of that was part of the, the joy of our relationship where I wasn't coming in stealing their ideas, which happens a lot there, where, you know, white people come in and they go, oh, you know, make this handbag. That's totally Zulu style. It's totally their work. Only then you're selling it all over the world. I mean, I was never doing that. I kind of came in with very particular Liza vibe going. And they could decide to do it or not. And, you know, there was just, they had a sense of humor about me. They just thought I was so weird. <laughs> was it the same group that stayed with you for a decade? Yeah, 15 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, over time, though, um, I did... I did have these breaking points in my life living there and working there where I realized I was so um, focused on my ideas that I wasn't allowing the place to influence my work. I wasn't allowing my heart to be broken. I wasn't allowing for, for really what this place was saying. I was always hitting my head against the wall of a very chaotic environment. And so... Um, I started to think about like, what is natural to the team. And, and this, um, so I'll show you a slide here. This is called the Book of Days. And what it is is that these are 365 individually woven cloths that are just made with needle and thread. And part of the reason that I did a project, a weaving project like this, is I needed to give the women something they could do at home um, so that they didn't have to come into the city and risk themselves all the time coming in. That was a problem just in terms of how dangerous it was. A lot of, um, you know, just put them at risk. I was wondering if that's what led to these individual panels. Yes. That comprise so many of the works during this period. So mm -hmm. they were working on these panels at home. Yes, they, they would work on strips. So I often thought about the work, like there's something really amazing about, I think I feel like all of my art has had a starting point, but then I've been jumping off it ever since. You know what I mean? Like I gave myself a really juicy start with the kitchen. Mm -hmm. A lot to think about. And I've been jumping off it ever since. And so in a lot of ways, this book of days couldn't have existed without other things that I made and without the specific problems of working where I was. Like the specific issues of, of no longer having a space to put things together, where things had to fit in your brassiere to get home safely. That was a cool challenge. Mm -hmm. You know, like, hmm. What could they do from home? Like, what could we make that has this, those parameters? It became those those problems became artistic kind of um, boundaries, edges. Uh, so, and I got really fascinated too with the idea of anonymity, the anonymity of labor, so that you could never see all that went into that sculpture. You know, I mean, labor is such a big part of what you've always done. It's such a it's a big component. So how do you think about the labor of this other group of people that are working with you and and their compensation? And um, how did you think about that? You must have thought really deeply about it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I have to say, turning yourself inside out. I mean, firstly, when I got to there, um, when I first started the project, um, my whole human self was up for a lot of questions. You know, just my my unbelievable, not only white privilege, but my artist privilege. I mean, everything was, I had a, a really deep, deep, deep time of hardly being able to walk around. Like, it was like, I really, really had to really ask some deep questions. And yes, like, I realized I stepped straight into a totally <laughs> um, patriarchal, racist construct which is the pyramid of the of the white boss on top and all of the black workers below and i realized i was standing in it and what the fuck do i do now kind of thing you know like i went in with so much excitement like this is so great and then realized oh my god what it really when you're really sitting in it and you're really open to what this means and asking those questions it was um and i had many i i just 
what I started to do right, right, right from the top was talk to the team and ask them, what do you want? What do you need? What, what, how much do you want to be paid? What is the ideal thing? What do you, and it was like, oh, here's how much I need to be paid. I need to build my mother's home. I need to, it was like all these things. And I realized, oh, I'm going to be here a while. Mm. I'm not going to, this is not a five minute project. This is, this is a lifetime. And, um, so those kinds of questions were really, really deep. And it just, I, I sometimes was like, um, I got to get out of here. I can't, I can't stand in this. This is so, this is like crazy, um, difficult. Um, but then I would look over at the team, they'd be laughing their heads off. Like, you know what I mean? They would just be doing their work. So there's a, there's a white tautology that we have where we really can just bite our own tails and not do anything anymore. We just stop getting out there and doing what we need to do. Do the good work. Do the hard work. You know, do the hard work. And the hard work means, yeah, be the white asshole that has to face your whiteness. But don't not do it. So that was my, my real lesson. Um, and, um, and now they've started their own business. Yes, so. yes. In the end, I, you know, I, had, I was telling um, someone this the other day, you know, I have this huge storeroom worth hundreds of, like, um, uh, what do you, like, uh, metric tons of beads, right? And I used to tell myself, I'll be able to leave South Africa when we finish using all these beads. And like, you know, sort of um, this sort of fairy tale where you can finish and make turn, turn it all into sculpture. And in the end, I realized that the epiphany was to give it to the team. So I ended up giving them my entire stock and, my, and all of the equipment, all the tables and chairs. And they started their own collective, which is called Intombeziwe Yazama, which means a ladies helping each other. Oh. So it's pretty cool. You just it's it's really very very cool. I'm not involved in it at all in any sense. It's theirs, but it's it's pretty wonderful when they send me pictures and I'm like, oh, look what they're doing with that bead, you know? I mean, it's just it's cool. So let's uh, next um, next. This is um, there's a lot of monochrome now. Oh yeah, it's the big installation. Yes, this is called The Waves. This is after the Book of Days where I suddenly was like, you can't just stack all those because each one of those cloths that I stacked in that last um, image is actually an incredible minimalist painting. And the way that they're made is, let's see, I think I have, I'm going to show you, I'm going to flash through and then I'll come back. And they're visible. Um, here's one close-up. Um, the streaks that you see are just the oils of the hand. Mm -hmm. So the, I was so excited because I realized, oh my God, we're making these oil paintings. And the, the marking is being made through the accretion of time, the accretion of the materiality, and the lives that are happening to all of us as we're working. You know, like if, if, um, if you slip and if something slips, you know, you make a mistake or something. There's a, there's a humanity. So I'm really interested in the humanity of minimalism, kind of. You know, I don't even call my work minimalism, but, you know, that the humanity in a, in a monochrome, how much can happen uh, through caring and through attention. So every one of these that you're seeing are made with the same white bead that are made especially for us in Japan. And they're a very matte material and specifically mm -hmm. matte because it holds the oil uh, of the hand. So, um, you don't wash these because the oil, but it's interesting thing because what's actually happening is it's the thread that's getting stained as you're sewing. And the thread is what you're seeing through the beads more than anything. So it's not on the surface. So you could wash it, but it would be just hard to ever get it to be purely white. I just love that. I mean, it's another one of these projects that very few people have seen, but it's super exciting to see installed because you're enveloped in this womb of love and labor like you know marcia's title labor of love you're literally um i thought that it would feel prison like but it doesn't it's like an embrace it's an overwhelm yes yes it was at the zeitz exactly in cape town and where, where um, is it now in my storage in, okay. in LA, in my warehouse. Okay. But it was funny that you should say at the Zeitz because we um, brought the whole team to Cape Town when it opened. And that was such a wonderful moment. 
because, um, you know, they're always teasing me at how crazy I am and my crazy stuff I have them doing, you know, like, okay, we'll do, the, you know, like they would pray for me and, um, and they could literally point to them and know which ones they made. And that looks like it was a five-year project. It was several years. Several yeah. Years. It was ongoing. Work. Yeah. yeah. It was part of the, um, um, ethos of the, of the studio is that I wanted to have projects that were like that, where I didn't have to constantly think up a new thing because people needed work constantly. There was no, um, people couldn't afford for my little whims, you know, my little, oh, you know, headache today. No, no, no. We, everyone needed this consistent work. So it led to making a body of work over a long period of time that was, wouldn't have been made if that hadn't been another one of our edges, another one of the challenges. How do you keep people working? How do you keep, how do you keep a large team going? And almost all those works that were created during that time in Durban are are gridded works, right? They're they're made out of pieces. Yeah, yeah. And there's yeah. some sort of grid, either dispersed together, stacked, whatever. So, yeah, that did you know, happen. It's true. It happened. Yeah, it, it just became more and more. I think what happened really was that from the kitchen, I was commenting on labor, and now we were living in labor. We were living in in what labor truly means. Um, how do I say that? Because, I mean, obviously I was making the kitchen and I was laboring. But there was something about I just didn't need to describe something. We were, we were it. We were the thing. And so it meant I didn't have to have a set piece anymore. It was implicit. So um, now I felt like I could just talk about beauty and I could get down to something so simple. And we could just say, God, isn't it just astonishing what happens if you care about something really simple? Can you believe that you could just take beads and thread and that would happen? Like, that really was an epiphany for me. That you, you didn't have to like, oh, you could just do something so subtle. I feel like there's a conversation with some durational artists like Hannah Darboven, even Maya Lin, and the kind of repetitive work and the durational work that they do that within that framework of of a minimal aesthetic and and a particularly feminine or feminist uh twist on on minimalism mm. more human irregular handmade um i don't know who are your heroines well who do you think about you know i thought a lot about agnes martin um especially living in South Africa. You know, she said artists shouldn't have pets. They shouldn't have children. Ooh. You know, they should be, you know, she lived a very, uh, you know, an ascetic life. And I was like surrounded by a very messy, super, a lot of, lot of drama, lots going on. And so I thought, oh, you know, like, because I think that as an artist, you should do that. You should say these like dramatic things so that someone younger goes, you know, and goes and does the opposite thing, right? Because it opens another door. It's not that you have to make them wrong. You could just like go like, what would it, you know? Like, what about if what if Agnes was worked in community? Like, what about that? You know, like, what about community? Like, how is how is community? You know, like, or how is social practice? I don't know. How does it embrace what would be an ascetic kind of vision? Because I do have an ascetic vision. I always have. You know, that idea of working alone in the kitchen is like a very kind of um, priestess kind of vibe, you know, like I'm going to be alone, you know. So, um, did you ever read her diaries? Agnes? She was kind of, <laughs> so. yeah, but they're great, right? They're great, except she talks about the artist exclusively in with the male pronoun. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's true. He, 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 when she's talking about herself, which mm -hmm. I found fascinating, but that was her time. Maybe that was the time. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that is funny, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, we all get schooled in the patriarchy, you know, and that's part of why um, when people say, well, how can there be so many women museum directors and yet women have had a hard time? Well, everyone was schooled in the same way, right? It's changing and shifting. You're one of the people that changes and shifts it, but, you know, there's a lot of people that, you know, artists included, that write themselves out of history, which is so weird.
Anyway. I mean, when Marcia became a museum director, she said, I had to because it was the only way I could work in a museum was to create one. You know, I, to create one I could be the head of because there weren't museum directors who were women then at all. So, you know, think about that. So a lot, a lot has changed, but mm-hmm. there's but a, a lot still needs to change, mm. I would say. So. Next slide. Okay. Next slide. This is a piece called Gather One Million, and um, this is about the joy of labor. This is the apotheosis of labor. This is where, this is the harvest, because the fact is, um, all right, working on the kitchen alone was like kind of hard, I'll say, you know, I mean, it's a drag when you're, you're, you're like 21 and your friends are going to parties and you're beating a frying pan. You know what I mean? Like, it's just a, I'm going to say it, it was a drag. It was hard. Um, so the team in South Africa taught me about total joy of making. Because, you know, just what would go on in the in the room together was just, um, I, I needed to make a work that was really about that. So this is, um, these are sheaths of um, kind of wheat, I would call them. And they're, they're, again, you can never see or appreciate the labor because it goes into the center of the piece, but they're wires. It's called Gather One Million because it's one million blades of what I call grass. And they're thread on these pieces of wire, which are then stacked, 71 by 71 stacks. And 202, someone's going to get my math wrong. I'm really bad. I, but I... I've written it down somewhere, but by memory, it's 202 um, blades of grass per sheath and then um, goes across. So it's very specific and it's a painting because none of this is just set there accidentally. Every single one of these sheaths is labeled um, and in a particular spot. So I blended them together to have that kind of fade that you see. So I think I may show you the overview again. So that white fade on the left is sort of this kind of painting. So it's another work that you have to see in person um, to have a ex- real true experience of it. But um, they're incredibly textural. Mm-hmm. They really get built up mm-hmm. and are in- incredibly sculptural too. I don't know if you have some photographs of those. Yeah, um, of other works that are more sculptural. There was a period where Yes, it's well, like fungus or yes, lichen well, or something. Okay, well, here's one. This is, you know, another body of work. I mean, one of the things that I, you know, kind of always tried to do is, um, I know one work of art seems to inform the next, but this was related actually to the security fence, the original one that I showed you, where I was thinking about the Middle East and I was thinking about um, these prayer rugs. And um, this was the, the epiphany. This was the, the really where my work started to become abstract. Um, I wasn't full tilt making abstract work yet. I was following a pattern, which um, everything that you're seeing are beads balanced on their tips. Um, I labeled each and the team, we were just balancing them with the tweezers. And what was happening in the studio was um, I painted these huge aluminum panels and then marked what color went where. So it was very, very, very precise work. But while we were working, um, I was, I, um, we rented a space in an ecumenical center, um, and it was a, a haven. It was a place of safety during apartheid where um, uh, religious organizations were safe from apartheid because the, um, the, the, the police couldn't come in to a religious organization. So it was a hiding place for a lot of people. And the building, that was, that was a history of where we were. Um, so, and it continued to be this kind of haven. Um, there were all kinds of social justice groups, and they allowed me to be there because of the social component to what we did. And I had a lot of, we had a lot of programs that we built within the studio team to um, basically alleviate poverty and build women's um, businesses and all this stuff. So there was a lot of programs involved. Anyway, long story short, in this ecumenical center, there was this big courtyard, and one day, um, 200 refugees stormed the building. Um, there had been this um, retribution. There was a, like political stuff, and that was what it was like living there. There was some day, you know, one day there would be kind of relative peace, and then the next day a huge upheaval would happen. So suddenly there were these 200 refugees sitting in the center of this courtyard, and the team really freaked out. They thought that they were coming to kill them. And um, I just remember thinking, God, they don't teach you this in art school. You know, like, wow, this is this is you know, it was just really, really, really intense. 
And that night I kind of went home and I realized I'm not letting this place um, influence the work. I'm busy balancing beads on their tips. What the heck? Like, that's insane. Actually, what we're doing, I'm not letting the work show any of what's going on in my life or what's going on in, the, in, in, the, in this environment. So the work just started to go off course. And the next day I went in and got a hammer and hammered all the beads off so much of what we'd done and then started over and started to work into this abstraction. And, um, and that was really where I just broke free from it. I just, I was like, I have to allow, um, chaos. I have to allow for slippages and for mistakes and for all that's happening. And, and it was this, um, and I think it's still true today, you know, living through this pandemic and living through these times that we're living in that, you know, if we're not taking this moment, if we're all the time trying to get back to how it was, we're missing the opportunity, right? to live from this and to grow from this. Um, so I feel like um, my years in South Africa were such a training ground for right now. I mean, such a training ground for living in, you know, upheaval. Other parts of the world live in it all the time. With many of us, this is all new. And now you're back from South Africa and you're mm -hmm. working solo. Yeah. Yeah. And you're working on something entirely new. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, working at the starting place of like real zero, which is really kind of the most exciting thing in the world and, and scary, I suppose, if you want to, if you want to be scared, you could be scared, but you don't have to be. So it's like, that's what I tell myself, you know, put on your big girl pants. Um, this is, um, this is actually the last show that I did in New York at Lima Malpin before the new, new, new stuff. But this is an example of how, just how abstract it really got. Um, I started to smash the beads off the off the cloths with a hammer and see what's underneath, you know, like what's holding the material together. It became really exciting. You know, like what happens when you just you're willing to lose it all? And that's so thrilling. So I do think that, yeah. Weren't there a lot of weather metaphors in this work too? Yes. I was thinking about clouds. And um, one of the things in, in Durban um, where I was living was that they have these dramatic Turner clouds, mm -hmm. you know, so you could be looking around on the streets and see all this degradation and, and horror and suffering, it's true suffering. And, uh, and then just look up and go, oh my God, it's a Turner. So, you know, it's like, look up. So it led to this whole body of work of painting um, uh, on the cloths and allowing myself um, to have my own voice and hand that I hadn't had since I made the kitchen because I was working so much with others. The work became so much about repetition that I'd, I kind of disappeared in, in that sea of hands. I was just another sea of hands. And so to allow myself to paint was a big breakthrough for me. Um, and not to sit and go, but what is, how does it connect to the kitchen? You know, it's like, come on, <laughs> in 30 years. Yeah. So. All right, you've got a, a great new book. We're here launching it tonight. Um, thank you, Rizzoli. Thank you, Lima Mopin. And uh, that must be really meaningful, too, to see all of that together. What does it mean to you? It's great. I mean, um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a privilege, for sure, to have that book. It's amazing. I'm still here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're out of the kitchen I'm out of the kitchen yeah out yeah. of the kitchen yeah yeah well said and into the clouds <laughs> that's well said <laughs> so i don't know if you want to take any questions uh, anyone has any questions it's been great talking thank you, lisa thank you so much I enjoyed it very much what is the new work that you're starting from ground zero? Well, when the studio team um, started their official collective, they had actually started it during the years that we were working together, but now it's, you know, it really became the handoff of here's the materials and um, officially closed the studio. We had a five-year exit strategy, which ended right when COVID hit. So it was like we had planned it. And... Um, for me, though, there was a real, it was a real shift to suddenly go from this 
joyful room full of wonderful people to being alone. And it led me to really think about what my hands can make in my lifetime. And I'm knowing I'll never be able to repeat what I had with those women, never. And I'm not even going to try. So um, what, what do I have, you know? And it's really led to making work that's, that's about what my human body can make in a lifetime. And I don't know how much of it I can do in a lifetime, but I'm painting and um, getting ready for a show with uh, Tadeusz Ropak in Paris in April. So I'm being very secretive about showing it yet because it's, it's new, but I'm really excited about it. Yeah. Um, going back to the kitchen, I'm just curious. Um, do you ever have conflict or compensation for using like Captain Crunch or all those Malbar did you use or something cigarettes? I certainly have used just about every product, but I know um, the Kellogg's. I think you used. I never had a conflict, and I never was paid either, though. So. You and know, they didn't it's care. Free advertising. Free you know, it's not like I was making, you know, mass oh, productions. You What's your day job, it. by the way? Waitress, and I sold prom dresses. While, while that was on tour? No, um, I was able to make a living as an artist. I think I was about 23 when I was officially able to make a living as an artist, which is pretty cool. I mean, I was, I'm not saying it was a lavish lifestyle, but, you know, I didn't have a car, for example, for a long time. But... Um, in California, that means something. You guys are like, well, of course you didn't have a car. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, yeah, I had day jobs. And then um, the Nortons, Peter and Eileen Norton, bought the kitchen uh, in 1996. That. that was like, that. what happened then, I could make the next work. So I took all of that and made a backyard um, and funded it. And I've kind of done that ever since. You take what sells and then put it into the next work. Not that you asked, but I'll tell you. <laughs> Any last questions? All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.